This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, only a week has passed since you last saw us, and yet there is plenty of new and exciting ag news to discuss in just a short amount of time. Hi again, folks. So glad you could join us for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I am Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Burgamy. As Ray mentioned, we do have plenty of information for you today. Coming up on the program, despite an abundance of rain in both November and December, we'll hear from one cotton expert on why he thinks the outlook for the producers right now is promising. Also on the program, in part two of our feature on the Lovejoy City Garden, Mayor Bobby Cartwright tells us about some new things in store for the property and why they're already ahead of the game when it comes to planting tomatoes. Plus, see how the Queen of Kale turned a simple kitchen experiment into a thriving business geared towards giving people and school kids some healthier options. These stories and much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. UGA has recently completed their cotton production meetings across the state. We caught up with one group in Mitchell County, got an inside look at this year's preparations for the Georgia cotton producers. Mitchell County is one of the top three cotton producing counties in the state, according to the Georgia Cotton Commission website. Growers in the county were responsible for over 118,000 bales in 2014. Many of those producers were at the UGA cotton production meeting to get the latest on planting, potential problems, and the concerns of recent cotton prices. Every year it's something else, something new that, we're, that will come up, some new question, some new issue that we have to address. And the UGA cotton team does a great job doing that, and this is a, a wonderful opportunity for, for the people in Mitchell County and really all counties in uh, cotton producing areas in Georgia to really to get an update and find out what's going on for the new year. Shirley is Ag and Natural Resources agent and spends a lot of time talking to cotton and peanut producers about their crops and preparing the fields for planting. So really across the board, um, we, re we really want the, uh, to get those plants out of the ground, growing as quickly as possible, uniform stand. So yes, yeah, certainly rain in the past few years has been, has been an issue for the cotton growers and the peanut growers, sure. Dr. Jared Whitaker, Extension Cotton Agronomist, told us that this year, like last growing season, will have its challenges. You know, Georgia's always variable. There's always wet spots and dry spots and wet, wet areas and dry areas. We're just getting started. A lot of guys are working in the field, um, getting things started. But, you know, in Georgia, we have, it doesn't take long for us to dry out and get things started. You know, we had, a, we had a pretty wet fall, and you can see a lot of guys honestly left cotton in the corners of fields, and we had some that were just been too wet to get to. But starting to see more and more guys starting to get started and you know with our equipment and our ability to make things happen we won't be too late we will be able to catch up and, and, and get things going pretty fast they're sticking to the rotations they're they're just seeing where where they can save save money whether it's uh, inputs or maybe they aren't planting as much acres and I'm sure every situation every farming situation is going to be a little bit different but this year for sure um, they'll ne definitely need to make sure that they sit down and pencil out everything um, economic wise to make sure that they're going to be uh, where they need to be this year or it's best case scenario as possible I suppose. After nearly 50 production sessions in the last two months, Whitaker thinks weather has been the dominant topic that he's had to discuss. We had I guess you'd say historical rainfall events as far as in the cotton harvest window. It happened, started late for us and you know, from a historical standpoint, fiber quality from a color standpoint is related a lot of times to how much rainfall we get. And so I track color and our fiber quality throughout the year and, and over time. And our color as far as fiber quality was as poor as it's been in at least 15 to 20 years. So to me, that gives you a good indication of how wet a fall we had and ultimately why we left cotton in the field. And next week on The Monitor, Damon Jones takes a closer look at cottonseed oil and how it could impact the industry. In other ag news, April 25th, that is the official start date for Vidalia onion season, as confirmed by Georgia Ag Commissioner Gary Black. The start date, of course, meaning no sweet onions labeled or marketed as Vidalias can be shipped prior to midnight on the 25th. 
Many of the growers, however, saying they prefer to ship much sooner than that, but that April 25th target date, part of an ongoing effort by Georgia to protect the Vidalia name and to make sure that no substandard early season onions reach consumers. A new report says honey production was down in 2015. According to U.S. Agnet, honey production from producers with five or more colonies totaled 157 million pounds. That's down 12 percent from 2014. Additionally, there were just over 2.6 million colonies from which honey was harvested in 2015, down 3 percent from 2014. And hey, literally. Georgia hay producers gathered in Moultrie recently for the 8th annual Southeast Hay Convention. It was a great opportunity for farmers to learn how to grow hay that will give livestock more nutrition and producers more profits. The Monitor's Mark Wildman has the report. At Spence Field in Moultrie, hay producers got a great chance to learn how to grow better hay for livestock in Georgia. At the 8th annual Southeast Hay Convention, UGA forage specialist Dennis Hancock, along with other experts from UGA, we're on hand to educate producers on how to get the most out of their hay fields. And this year we've really brought in several key themes, uh, one on, on weed management and weed biology, and then also looking at uh, uh, alfalfa in Bermuda grass and highlighting some of the successes we've had there. Uh, looking at sprigging in new Bermuda grass fields as well. We have a real interest in that these days. No matter how many years you have been growing hay, there is always something new to learn that can help you improve quality and profitability. If you, if you don't come to uh, all these educational programs that you can come to, uh, you'll get stagnant. You'll start doing the same thing over and over again. But uh, if you've been in the business long enough, you know every year is going to be different. You'll have different weed problems, production problems, fertilizer. It, it's all different. Georgia has great growing conditions for growing hay. With plenty of sunshine and good temperatures, the grass grows fast, but so do the weeds. And managing weeds is a big part of hay production. Whatever pound of weed is produced usually is going to cost us two to three pounds of, of uh, hay. So it's really critical that we stay on top of the weeds. And particularly from, from a perspective of producing for horse quality hay, if there are any weeds or any kind of contaminants in that, uh, it really devalues that crop uh, considerably. So trying to stay ahead of that, maintain a really good, thick, vigorous stand, and uh, the absence of weeds can really be uh, 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 marketing value as well as quality value to the, to the producer. Georgia producers who sell their crop or just feed it to their livestock need to make sure they get the most out of their hay crop. You know, you're spending $600 an acre to produce an acre of grass, and uh, that adds up. With fertilizer, chemicals, you got to do a better job of managing it. You put it on some of your better fields. Uh, it's an ongoing project. Good hay is vital for any livestock operation and the farm benefits greatly from feeding hay with a high level of nutrition. And that is one of the key measures of good uh, uh, economics for the beef cattle producer, for the dairy producer, is to have good quality forage so that they don't have to supplement as much. If you put quality hay into an animal, you're going to You'll have better growth. Uh, you know, you'll you you get out what you put in. That's basically what you what I'm saying. Um, if you put sorry hay in front of an animal, he may or may not eat it. He's going to have no growth. Uh, you're just losing money. So as the grass grows this summer, farmers can take comfort in knowing UGA experts are working alongside of hay producers to make sure Georgia's livestock stays healthy and producers stay profitable. Reporting from Moultrie, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Mark, great job as always. Now, when we come back, meet a woman whose homemade kale chips resulted in a thriving business that has even caught the attention of some of Georgia public school systems. The Queen of Kale, her story is next when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Last week on the show, we introduced you to the Lovejoy Mayor Bobby Cartwright and how he's using his creation, the Lovejoy City Garden, to help those in need within the community. Today, in part two of that story, Mayor Cartwright explains how the garden got started and the future plans that he has for it. I've been in Lovejoy now for 
15 years. I'm a, originally um, consider myself to be from South Georgia, uh, actually the Vidalia area, um, Tombs, uh, Wheeler, Montgomery County area. Um, and and I, I come up here chasing a, the dream of money and, and got involved in politics and fell in love with Lovejoy and moved here and uh, just so desperately missed my farm life. Started out with um, the first volunteer basis, a, a couple acres, no fences, no, no, no anything, just planting. Uh, it's a really good little piece of property and it just exploded. We already, as early as it is now, we're actually planting tomatoes today and I figure I'm probably four or five weeks ahead of the local northern area. It's because I know where to buy the plants in South Georgia that are already ready. So us helping them, I think, I, I think this could go anywhere. People want to see me run 100 acres instead of 14. Um, if that's what the citizens and the leaders in this county and that surrounding area call for, um, I'm willing to do whatever, wherever this takes us. We're, we're getting involved heavily this year with Georgia Grown and um, the education process, not from just, I mentioned the seniors and what we do with them um, and get them involved. We're, we're in the process of uh, involving the Lovejoy Middle School we're gonna, and the elementary school. We're gonna start, um, believe it or not, first and fourth uh, have criteria for uh, agriculture in their curriculum now and we're gonna get involved in that. We're gonna be doing um, come to the garden days, tours with the buses and with the, with the surrounding children. And uh, it's amazing what we have here that people have just come and enjoy. We've been very fortunate that good people have found us and, and wanted to hear the story. And it's a, it's a great story. You can follow us on the website. You can come visit us. Um, Lovejoy is about as close to Mayberry as you're gonna get. Well, long before becoming the Queen of Kale, Nisia Gates says her claim to fame was an aspiring musician in Detroit who even appeared on the soundtrack from the Whitney Houston movie, Waiting to Exhale. These days, however, she's singing a different tune. A self-proclaimed serial entrepreneur, Nisia is passionate about providing healthier options for both kids and adults. <music> I was searching for healthy snack options besides peanut butter and, and potato chips and, you know, crunchy, salty, and I came up with kale chips. As a Georgia-grown member and proud supporter of farm-to-table programs, Nisia Gates is spreading her message. Better yet, messages. Philosophical, yet straight and to the point. And it all began in her kitchen as a way of looking out for her family's best interest. I got a dehydrator and a blender, and I started playing around with different recipes, and they were a hit amongst my family, amongst friends. And this was maybe three years ago, and me and my entrepreneurial self, you know, thought, well, maybe I could be making some money doing this. And so, with no pricing plan, Nisia set out with kale chips in hand, hitting all the local stores. And just like that, it happened. I got an order on the spot. So I think that was an indication that, okay, maybe you can make this into a business. And I took it from there, got into a commercial spot, like a shared kitchen, so that the costs were low. And I was able to produce um, and, and service stores and, and be legitimate in Georgia because you can't do it from home. So the shared kitchen was the best way for me to do it. And after a year, we got Whole Foods um, in Kroger, and then I moved into my own spot, and I'm expanding now. As for why she chose kale as her superfood of choice, Nisia tells me in addition to being rich in vitamins and minerals, it also dehydrates very well, and when flavored, has that crunchy snack-like texture so many people crave. And that includes little people, school kids to be exact, another area where the queen of kale is in the process of making her mark. I'm super excited about that. Um, I'm not sure which flavors they're gonna go for, but um, Georgia is trying to, again, with the locals, so it's a benefit. They are trying to make, the, the school districts are trying to make 20% of the, the, the kids' meals provided from a local company, whether it's breakfast, whether it's lunch. 
And so they're looking for local companies like myself to provide healthy options for these kids so that they're you know, not eating the way they've been eating for all these years. Um, so I did my first trade show for the schools about a month ago and the feedback was incredible. The ultimate goal for my company would be to really, um, I want to do it all. I mean, I want to I want to be on the shelves as an everyday name, brand name with Queen of Kale with my snacks, of course, um, across the country, maybe internationally too. Um, and I want to have, I want to share my food. So um, this takeout spot is a start to something bigger that I see, um, fresh, fast foods. And for more information on the Queen of Kale brand or information on how to place an order, just log on to the address you see there on your screen. That is www.queenofkale.net. And just a reminder, if you missed any part of this story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That is the Georgia Fire Monitor. Once there, of course, you can browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And once you're done watching all those informative stories, keep clicking and like the Georgia Fire Monitor Facebook page we set up for you. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, feel free to send us a message either on Facebook or at the address listed below. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Well, her job is director of the Flint River Partnership, but to Casey Cox, it's more than just a job. It is a passion. Her story when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Stay with us. Welcome back and some exciting news for the Georgia Farm Bureau. Say hello to Katie Gazda, who was recently named as program specialist and executive director of the GFB Foundation. Katie says she wants to engage both small and large corporations in her new role. My main role is executive director for the Georgia Farm Bureau Foundation, and through that I'll be fundraising for the foundation and its four main pillars, which are Ag in the Classroom, Scholarships, Leadership Development, and Community Outreach. In addition to those responsibilities, I'll also be working with the Field Services Department at Farm Bureau, um, helping with the, their various committees, including Young Farmers, Ag in the Classroom, the Women's Program. Recently, we spent the day with Casey Cox, a sixth generation Georgian who just finished college three years ago and has returned to Camilla to help run the family farm. She shares a small part of her story with us today. Uh, my name is Casey Cox and I work for the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District. My job is to be the director of the Flint River Partnership, which is an agricultural water conservation initiative started in 2004 and by the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District, USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service and the Nature Conservancy's chapter of Georgia. I grew up on a farm on the Flint River. I'm the sixth generation of my family to be here and to grow up here. And I realized when I went off to college how special it was to, to be from this place and, and how important agriculture was to our area and also how important the Flint River is and, and what a special place it is. And I started getting involved with the Flint River Partnership back when at the very beginning of college and working with their initiatives and, and realized that they were doing things here in Southwest Georgia that were, that were more innovative than anywhere else in the country related to water and irrigation and conservation. And it really inspired me to uh, take that course, the, the conservation path. And I majored in natural resource conservation at the University of Florida, go Gators. And it's been uh, an incredible journey. I get to do what I love every single day. I get to talk to people about conservation efforts and all of the great things that farmers are doing in our area to preserve our natural resources and, and be stewards for the next generation. And I certainly feel like I've, I've lived that with my father. If I, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to return to Southwest Georgia if my father and the four generations before him hadn't been stewards of this land. So it's, it's really personal for me and, and my job is something that, that I, really, I really appreciate and love. When my dad is ready to retire, I would really like to be the one to, to step up and, and start managing the farm operation. I want to learn every aspect of it. I've already started learning some of the, the background business aspect of it with the finances and everything. And I'm also very familiar with some of the daily operations just living on the farm. Uh, 
but I have a lot to learn, a tremendous amount to learn, and, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can from my dad. Next week, we'll hear from Casey's father, Glenn Cox. He says he believes Casey is ready to manage the family farm. Finally today, with farmers and ranchers making up less than 2% of the U.S. population, finding new ways to get agriculture story out to the public is now more important than ever. And that is the purpose of the annual GFB Educational Leadership Conference, as it encourages the spread of ag education in both the classroom and around the household. Damon Jones has the story. Volunteers from all over the state recently gathered in Augusta for the Georgia Farm Bureau Educational Leadership Conference. It provided a number of different seminars and informational sessions, but just one goal. The main focus on our conference is um, agricultural literacy, and we are here to give volunteers ideas um, to how to take um, ag literacy into their classrooms and um, in the community. With the younger generation moving further and further away from the farm, the message of agriculture and its importance to the future of our country is being somewhat lost. Combine that with all the misinformation being spread about the industry, it's now vital to get the true information into the schools. Um, it is so very important to have ag in the classroom to teach the children the real story of agriculture and what our story is because there are so many um, groups out that are telling uh, stories that are not the true agriculture story. So it's up to us to provide people with the true story of agriculture. And that story, along with classroom activities, will provide kids with all the information needed to ask important questions about where their food comes from and why it's important. My students have no clue where their food comes from when school starts. They just assume you go to Walmart, you go to Kroger, you buy it, it shows up at, you know, on the table. So now that they've heard all of these farm terms and all these different plants that we've looked at, now they're starting to ask questions. But when school started, they didn't have a clue where to start asking. Most of the classroom activities discussed here involve the use of materials you come in contact with every single day. That makes it easy for both the students and the teachers. The activity I just did involves only household items, so you can do it very inexpensively, very easily in any sort of classroom, elementary up to high school. You know, we think of DNA as being very small, but when you do this protocol, it's really big, it's recognizable. So it, it brings, it hits home for the students that DNA is important and that there's a lot of it. A number of hot button issues were also discussed, including the use of GMOs in food and a number of misconceptions that are being spread about it. It's a topic that will only increase in importance as the world's population continues to be on the rise. In the next 30 to 40 years, we're going to have to produce more food than we have produced in the past 10,000 years. That is an enormous challenge and we're going to need every tool at our disposal uh, in order to meet it. Speaking of using every tool, these volunteers also want to encourage farmers to speak with kids and host field days as they can give a unique perspective. I think that the easiest way to start is to go for those younger grades, kindergarten, first, second, because it's so easy to tie in those science, and those literacy standards. And we're always looking for people to come in and do something fun with our kids. Give these teachers some information about what your strengths are, and I promise you they won't turn you down. Reporting from Augusta, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, thank you very much, sir. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Just a reminder, for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor show. So long, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.